the Prudential Family Hour of Stars. Today, a story called Breakdown. Our star, a guest for the occasion, Mr. Joseph Cotton. It was the winter of 1930. Uh, well, no matter. I, I was sitting in Ed Snyder's cabana when I saw the bellboy coming carrying a telephone with one of those plug-in gadgets on it. It was an annoyance because Ed and I had been talking about a try at that well-publicized Miami fishing before my drive back to New York. Mr. Mr. Carlos, are calling New York for you, sir. Your office, I think. Oh, it would be the office. Any name? Well, it sounded like Hubka, sir, Mr. Hubka. No, uh, Hubka. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have to answer it. Sure, go ahead. I can plug it in right here, sir. You can never escape the discontented. <laughs> trouble, Bill? No, no, trouble. Just routine. I had a farmer bookkeeper. I suppose this is a final appeal to charity and justice. It always comes. Fix me a drink while I'm talking to him, will you? Sure. Here's the phone, sir. I don't know why these things have to happen. I'm on a vacation. I want to fish and talk about fishing or rest or read. At least I don't want to have to wrangle with a discharged bookkeeper. No, oh, well. The phone, sir. Thanks. Hello. Met you, Hupka? Hello. Uh, hello, Mr. Callow. I'm terribly sorry to disturb you. I wouldn't have done it's it. It's all right, all right, Hupka. What is it? Well, it's about your letting me go, Mr. Callow. After 12 years, I... Well, it, it's hard to understand, sir. And I thought maybe... I hope there's just some misunderstanding. You've always approved of my work. Work ready yet, Ed. I'm going to need it. This is going to be worse than I thought. Just Bad, why huh? you had to let me go. Here. Hey, uh, I, look I at that blue water, man. Plenty of big ones out there just waiting for it. Aren't you listening to your man, Hubka? He's still talking mm -hmm. to me. He certainly is, too much. Hello, hello, Hubka. Hubka, look here. You must have got my memo, and I'm certain you understood it. There's nothing, nothing personal, nothing against your record, but you simply must realize that I can't reorganize my accounting department without dropping a man here and there. And... I know, Mr. Callow, but it, it, it's the upset. Yeah, the, Hubka, the please. Every night for years, my wife and I have talked about the company, my work. I can't do it. It was the biggest part of our life. Uh, but now, what can I say? What can I tell them? Please, Mr. Cowell. Yeah, boy, take this phone out of here. If Mr. Hubka calls back, just report me as unavailable. Yes, sir. That bad? Did you have to hang up on him? You can fire some men, and they, they take it with their chins up there. This one didn't. Broke down and cried. I, I don't like weaklings, period. Oh, come on, Bill. The man may not be a weakling. After all, the bottom dropped out of his world. He was honest enough not to pretend otherwise. But tears. Tears like a child. And man can't give in to his emotions like that. He has to if they're strong enough and everything else has failed. What do you mean by that? When all that a man knows and all that he's learned convince him that there is no hope, why, nature steps in to take a hand to save him somehow. From what? What did it save Hubka from? I don't know. Something. From killing himself, perhaps. Hmm. From wanting to kill you. The most human thing about human beings is their emotions. Couldn't go on living without them. Oh, I had you talk like an old woman. We went out on the Gulf Stream early the next morning, but we couldn't catch a minnow. I was thoroughly disgusted, and right after an early lunch, I was ready for my drive back to New York. Said goodbye to Ed. Had my convertible packed, and a half hour later was heading north. I stayed overnight at Jacksonville, and by sundown the next day, I hit a detour, a lonely red clay road running through the trees and the brush. I was just getting the hang of riding the center ruts when I saw a chain gang ahead. The convicts were getting ready to climb aboard a prison truck under the guns of two guards standing near it. The other side of the road was a tractor. The driver was bent low, listening to the motor. One of the guards signaled me to come on through, and I stepped on the gas again. But just as I came up to them... I tracked it back into the road in front of me. I caught at the wheel frantic, but trying to turn up at the rest held me. I saw the faces of guards and prisoners, and then my car smashed them all against the truck. <laughs> the next I knew anything, dust was falling on my open eyes. Fuzzy clumps of red dust. I'll close my eyes, I thought. They didn't close. 
It was as though I, I, I didn't know how. I, I tried to think of how it was done, but there was no response, no movement, no answer, nothing. I tried to move, get up. Nothing happened. I felt a pressure against my chest, and then dimly came the sensation that my head was tilted back oddly. The car seat must have been sprung, and I was trapped and looking upward. I tried to force movement somewhere in my body, but without success. No, no sense of pain, no sense of physical being at all reached my consciousness. And I remembered something out of a medical book. Motor control of nerves leading to the body muscles. Were mine paralyzed or, or just deadened temporarily? But anyway, I could hear. I heard footsteps. Somebody talking. Get over here, Sam. Come on, boy. No, sir, Pine. I'm safe. I mean, I'm going to get help for them, boy. Sam, you act like you was here, too. Them guards are cold. You figure that, boy? Real cold is our chance to get away like the others. I don't care. I'm going to get help down the road. Them two prisoners ain't dead. They need help, Pine, eh? You ain't got no more sense than this poor fool that comes smashing in here. Look at him. What are you doing? You get away from him. Don't fool with no dead man. I just want to look at this boy. Man, he's showing bad shape. He no good no more. Come in, look. No, no. I don't want to see him. I said come here. <laughs> Last thing I want to do is look man, at him. Man, look at him. Steering wheel done folded up in his chest somewhere. Oh, yeah. Oh, he's sure a mess. Oh, he gone, that boy. He dead all right. Mm -hmm. well, he should be. Done kill two other men. Maybe those two prison boys going to die, too. Oh, come on, Piney. Let's get going. Wait. Something moving in that boy's eyes. Oh, ain't nothing moving in his eyes but you. That's yourself you see bobbing around in him. Yeah? Yeah. Ain't healthy to see yourself in the dead man's eyes, boy. Get up in this car with me. Huh? Alongside that dead man? You sit on this side, I'll sit next to him. Uh, oh, what you to do? Lean back and get your feet against that dashboard whilst I put mine against the steering wheel. Now push. What for? We're going to get this boy loose. What for? He's dead, ain't he? That's right. Oh, sure. <laughs> Braced with their backs against the seat, they were managing to shove the steering wheel clear of me. To free me so that... No. No, why? Why, if they thought me dead? Once more. Once more, sir. That's good. Now, let me out of here. Sure. Who's holding you? What are you going to do? I expect I'm going to get away from these parts with these jailhouse clothes on me. How far'd I get? You mean you're going to take this dead man's clothes? Boy, I'm getting out of here. Goodbye. <laughs> now, dead boy, your valet is going to disenrobe you. I need them Sunday clothes. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return with Act Two of Breakdown, starring Mr. Joseph Cotton. Now, Act Two of Breakdown, starring Mr. Joseph Cotton. It was dark. I was still alone. The numbness that had replaced all ordinary sensations of flesh and nerves was ominous. But I tried to shake the feeling. And then... Then I, I thought I saw something moving from the side of the road, coming toward me. A, a shadowy blob of a thing. And then another, moving out from the underbrush. More came, and I knew they were human beings. And they swarmed all of the wreckage and picked up things and hustled them back into the sea. These were the people who lived in the miserable paper-plastered shacks along the road. They had heard the noise of the crash, and they had come not to rescue, but to plunder. At first, they ignored me as if they were awed in the presence of death. Here, we take this seat. But this dead was on it. No matter. Well, move them. You grab the seat now. Easy now. All right. They were determined in their actions, but not irreverent of the dead. They lured me gently. The seat was pried loose and removed. I, 
Heard the creaking of leather, my suitcases. Even the hood of the car was lifted. Lord knows what they wanted there. Spark, plug, fan, belt, and a knife slashed through the canvas, and I knew my convertible was minus most of its top. Wheels were taken off, carpets, everything. I lay there, unable to flex a muscle. And then, after a while, things got quiet. All was still and dark again, and something strange happened to me. I'd been angry, impotently furious at their plundering, but now, now that they were gone, what had I lost? Nothing but their voices and their company. Yes, their company. And now I was not only alone and helpless, I was alone with the dead. <laughs> A dozen times I had thought I heard approaching cars, and a dozen times I was wrong. But help must come. It always came. But something was needed. Something, something from me. A movement, a gesture, however hard to show them I was alive. I began to try with the whole of my mind and the whole of my will to send an impulse somewhere in my stiffened body and get a response. But there was nothing. I, I tried again. Not, not desperately, not in fear, but in a kind of determined anger and, and somewhere somewhere there was a reaction so, something had moved I, I couldn't tell what, where but I tried again hard, savagely hard and then I heard then I knew it was, it was a finger the little finger on my left hand I could move it I could make it rise and fall and it made a hesitant, painful sound against the floorboard of my car but it was enough it was movement. It was life. And when they came, they would know. I heard them drive up, bang the doors of their cars, crunch their feet on the rotten road as they made their first excited survey. I heard Sam's voice. Just like I told you, Sheriff. It's a real mess, ain't it? Yeah, yeah, I believe you, Sam. I just didn't know whether you wasn't exaggerating some. But you wasn't. Oh, no, sir. And right here's the man in the roadster, Sheriff. He the one who did it. Got himself killed the same second, too. Yes, I see. Suddenly a flashlight glared directly into my eyes. I couldn't close them against it. And then the light swung away. Hey, doctor. <laughs> a doctor. A doctor. A chance for me now. Hey, doctor. You want me, Sheriff? That man's still alive? Nope. He's done for. Now, so maybe you better take those others to a hospital. One of my men will take you in. Oh, you, uh, Luke. Huh. Doctor wasn't coming over to me. I moved my finger, but no one saw. I tapped with it, but no one heard. Now, uh, Luke, you run the doctor back to town with your car. But first, help me swing this body up on the truck with the others. You can drop them off at Chessie, the undertaker. <laughs> I was on the back of a small truck, I judged, and I could hear the driver up front talking to someone. Take a look back there, Joe. See how them steps are. Yeah. I can't see, Wade. It's too dark. Well, hold it a second. You're coming through a light. See him now? Yeah, yeah, all right. Three bodies, present and accounted for. I knew now I was in the truck with the bodies of the dead guards. From things the driver said, I knew the sheriff was just ahead of us and leading us to the undertaker. We began to pass buildings and some with lighted windows, and I knew we were in town. It was a sharp turn. I heard the sound of tightened brakes. Hey, you, Chelsea. You in there? Kind of late, ain't it, Sheriff? You hear what happened on the South Road, Chessie? Yeah. News is through town. Uh, how many? Three. We're bringing them in. Hey, you, Joe. You and Wade go in and get Chessie's roll of stretcher. Start cutting those bodies inside. Yes, yeah, sir. I was just fixing to go to sleep when I heard about it. They all identified. Yeah, all but one. His stuff's missing. But I got the license number of his car. It's a New York license, and I'll wire tonight. When I get his name and home address, I'll let you know so you can get in touch with his relatives. Okay. Hey, Joe, when you get through, run the truck over to Till's garage and thank him. Right. In the morning, I'll give you the identification, Chessie. 
All right, sir. But I had no intention of waiting until morning. The moment they brought me into the morgue, where it was light, I'd do something. Move my fingers so they'd see their mistake. Get me to a doctor. They were rolling out the stretch, and with it came my last chance to save myself. A chance that must not be wasted. Strength and time were running out together, and the two deputies were working quickly. And since I was the farthest from the rear of the truck, I'd be the last. I'd wait until I was in the building under the lights. And then, then when they lifted me from the stretcher, I'd signal. That moment, they would have to see my finger move. Hear it even. It couldn't fail. It, it, it mustn't fail. I repeated the words in my mind. Must fail. And suddenly, it was my turn. You have to jump in, Wade, and pull him down this way a little. Yeah. Easy there. Now, don't let his arms hang like that. Pick him up. Put him down at his side. You want him to catch in the doorway. We were moving through the doorway down a narrow hall and into a brightly lighted room. Now, the moment they lifted me, I'd start. Their eyes would have to be on me, but that moment, I, I waited. It would be my last chance if I missed it. All right, Joe. You can leave him right on the stretcher. I'll snap off the light. Oh. We'll get at him sometime in the morning. Okay. Come on, Wade. Let's get out of here. I wanted to crowd. No, no, no. Don't, don't snap off that light. Please. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return with Act Three of Breakdown, starring Mr. Joseph Cotton. Now, Act Three of Breakdown, starring Mr. Joseph Cotton. Sometimes the ultimate blow leaves a man resigned to his fate. <laughs> Yet my mind was sharp. My hearing seemed very keen now. In a few seconds, the light had illuminated the room. It had struck me that my vision was better. Perhaps a natural process of recovery was going on in me. Perhaps by morning, my faculties would be back, at least in some measure. I felt buoyed up with the hope of it. And I lay there and listened to the sounds of the town drifting back to me from this street. There was a multiplicity of them at first. Gradually lessening as the hour grew late. Then little by little things died down. An occasional car. A lone passerby. And then all was silence and time took over. Against my will, sleep came. Before I sank away, I tried to move my finger again. It was comforting. There was hope in that sound. Hope. Light was coming into my eyes again. It was morning. I was being car carried somewhere, and then before I knew where I was, those who had moved me were walking away. Then I heard voices, the voices of Chester, the undertaker, and a new voice. There they are, coroner, all of them. I see, Chetty, I see. Well, as soon as I convene the coroner's jury for the inquest out in front, I'll march them all back here to view the bodies. Hmm. You going to give me burial certificates on all these in the meanwhile? All but that unidentified one. You got any word on him yet? No. Imagine I'll be hearing before the day's over, though. Sheriff expects a while this morning and will notify the closest relative. Let me see that man. Well, this one? Yeah. <clears throat> Chest crushed. Odd angle of the head could mean a spinal condition. Probably a clean break. Death could have been instantaneous. You think so? They were close enough now for me to see them standing over me, very close. And I knew that this was the moment, the moment to move the little finger of my left hand. I tried to raise it, to tap with it as I had before, but something was wrong. I, I could feel the response, but no sensation of movement. I listened to the sound. Heard nothing, nothing. Frantically, I, I stopped and started again. If, if they left me now, I would, I would never have another chance. And I knew the impulse had gone to the finger as before. I could feel it. I could feel it. Then, then why? And then 
It came to me. When they lifted me onto the table, my left hand must have swung down under my thigh and caught under it. And the full weight of my body was on that hand. It was trapped. And I knew I was beaten. It was all over now. In a moment, they'd leave and then... <laughs> A rush of thoughts came through my mind, all of them underlining the coming of my death. Thoughts and then words, the words danced in front of me, words I remembered, and suddenly I knew them for words Ed had spoken to me in Miami Beach just two days before. And all that he knows, all that he's learned, convince a man he has no hope. That's when his emotion comes into play. To save him. To save him. Yes, to save anyone who at least has life, sweet, simple life to look forward to. <laughs> Suddenly, I was lonesome and frightened, frightened like a child. If only somebody would take my hand and I could feel it this final moment. One of, one of these two men, anybody, anybody at all. Well, Jesse, I guess that's all. When you get his name, you let me know. I'll do that, corner. From the kind of car he was driving, I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't turn out to be somebody right important. No, well, important, like yes, important. So important that I rule the lives of others. And I thought of Hubka crying. I knew why now. I'd cut him off from his little world as I was now cut off from all of it. And then, <laughs> then something gathered in my chest and choked in my throat. What Hubka had done, I, I was beginning to do. Never... Never since that devil boy comes to sudden grief that I ever given him before, but I, I, I couldn't help it. I, I was overcome. All right, Jesse. <laughs> Cover him up and we'll go. Whatever you say, Connor. Please. Go. Please. Well? Coming, Jesse? Wait, wait, wait a minute, Connor. Look at this man. Oh, what about him? Well, the dirt's under his eyes. Uh, there's something kind of... Yeah, see? Why? Why, yes, they seem to be watering. I've never seen anything quite like this before. Oh, looks like tears. The corner of his tears, like this. Oh, Lord. Here, let me put my head to his chest. Chess, are you right? There's a heartbeat. There's a heartbeat. <laughs> This man's crying. Get blankets. I'll fetch my bag in the front office and call the hospital. I didn't didn't, didn't believe. I didn't know whether to pray or... Then they suddenly take up his back with a blanket. Was spreading it over me. His head bent low as he tucked it in. He talked to me. There, son. He, he, He talked to me. You're safe now. He'll take care of you. We know. I don't blame you for crying. <laughs> Poor fella. Poor fella. Joseph Cotton will return in just a moment. Now here again is Joseph Cotton. All my thanks to the cast, and especially John McIntyre, who played Chessy. Now, next week, the Prudential family of stars will bring you Ginger Rogers. The following week, Ray Milan. So be sure to listen. Goodbye. Goodbye.